uh, good noon uh, to everybody. Where I stand now is is noon. Uh, it's really a wonderful uh, occasion uh, to see all of you. My name is Andrea Ballestero. I uh, teach in the anthropology department at the University of Southern California. And I am one of the two co-editors of Experimenting with Ethnography, a companion to analysis with my colleague and friend, Britt Ro Brit Ross Winterreich. And uh, today we have a, a what I think of, of, as a very exciting uh, event, uh, which will begin with a couple of uh, housekeeping pieces of information that I want to share. Um, I will walk you through the through the schedule of activities for the hour and a half that we're going to spend together, and uh, we'll soon get to the interventions by our our main guests. But uh, let me begin by saying again, thank you for being here and welcome to the celebration of the first year anniversary of experimenting with ethnography. We, Britt and I, are delighted to be here celebrating a book that, like many other things, many other books, saw the public light during our ongoing pandemic. As many other things that have upended, have been upended during these past few years, we did not manage to organize a book launch when the book was published. While for a while, we, or at least me, felt a bit uh, uncomfortable and even sad about this, this actually created a really interesting possibility. Rather than celebrate the launch of a book right after it became public, we are now able to think about the lives and uses of the book after a year. So we have been delighted to hear from many ethnographers, faculty members, students, ethnographers in industry, in NGOs and government agencies, that the book has in fact accomplished some of what we envisioned that is become a companion to their ethnographic work. So we have thought that in place of a launch, we would have a birthday party. And that is what brings us together today. So we'll go for about an hour and a half or an hour and 15 minutes. And our time together will be organized as follows. First, I'm going to make a, a quick introduction to the book about seven minutes or so, where I will speak about our ambitions as editors uh, when we conceived of it. Then we'll, we will hear from our three guests and we will introduce them properly in a moment. And then we'll offer some reflections on the book and how they have engaged with it. Third, we'll hear reactions from two of our authors uh, who will refer to some of the thoughts that have been offered by our guests. And following that, we will open it up for questions and conversation. And we have a number of our contributors, a number of our authors uh, uh, in the book here in the Zoom. So I hope that at that time, you all feel uh, welcome to join the conversation. So we decided to run this as a Zoom meeting rather than a Zoom webinar to make it a little bit more uh, intimate. So I will ask that you please bear with us as we manage technological challenges that are bound to happen as they just did to me after testing my camera three times this morning. Uh, and if you're able and willing to, to please turn on your camera so that we can have some faces uh, on the screen in addition to the, uh, you know, the names and the, and the pictures in some cases. Thank you. Good to see you all. Yes, that's wonderful. Um, so before I jump into the, the summary of the book, a couple of really important thank yous are, uh, are due. At my new institution, the University of Southern California, we are lucky to have the support of a number of entities. I would like to thank the Levan Institute for the Humanities and the Center for Science, Technology and Public Life, as well as the Anthropology Department and the Ethnography Studio. They all have provided essential support to make this happen. This is our first public event out of USC, and I am very excited about that. We also have uh, Cameron Johnston helping us uh, with the technology. And importantly, I want to thank uh, Katie Ulrich, the ethnography studio coordinator, without whom the intellectual design, planning, and organization of this event would have not been possible. So thank you, Katie. Um, 
So as you might know, a couple other small points, the book is open access, so it can be downloaded for free. And this was possible thanks to contributions from the libraries at UC Davis, Rice University, ITU Copenhagen, and MIT. And also a thank you to the Duke University uh, Press team, particularly uh, to our editor, Gisela Fusado, who made this possible and trusted the project from the beginning. Okay, so let me just frame briefly the book before we pass on to our guests. Experimenting with ethnography grapples with analysis as a constitutive process of ethnographic work. It picks up where we, Britt and I, felt that many discussions on ethnography as a form of knowledge production stopped. That is at the point where we were called to specify how we performed analysis. If analysis is the practice of immersing oneself in ethnographic, ethnographic materials and transforming them into insights that, that are not automatically apparent, how does exactly that almost magical process unfold? Our decision to tackle this question was inspired by what we saw as two main approaches uh, to the question of analysis. And, uh, and please allow me the, the sim simplification here just for the matter of of our conversation today. On the one hand, there is one way of thinking of analysis that describes it as this ethereal process that depends on a creative and affective spark that arrests you when unexpected. Often these sparks happen through the craft of writing and we are told that if those are, if we try to systematize them, they, we exhaust them as such, we dissolve them. On the other hand, we could think of another approach to analysis that presents it as a somewhat mechanical procedure, a procedure that flattens the richness of our ethnographic encounters, creating outcomes or insights through practices that we might call of breaking down, of dissecting, and in some times of counting. So our book in a certain way attempts to bypass both approaches. It does not assume that analysis must be a, an intractable creative process, nor does it assume that it is a violent mechanistic procedure. Rather, we take analysis as a practice of imaginative thinking that is resolutely grounded in a distinct understanding of empirics and an organized set of activities. So in a way, analysis is always shaped by an implicit or explicit set of political commitments as well. So more practically, in the book, we embrace a notion of ethnographic analysis that seeks ways of noticing that which seems to be there in one's materials or relations, but one cannot fully articulate as such. In this sense, ethnographic analysis shares a lot with what the Nigerian poet Ben Opry refers to as the quickening of the unknown, something that also Jane Dyer has uh, reflected upon. In Okri's usage, the notion of quickening does not refer to speed, but rather to something else, to the enlivening of an unknown, to marking its presence by drawing, in, drawing it into recognizable existence. In the constant of ethnographic knowledge production, analysis helps us accomplish that kind of enlivening. So the contributors to the book offer concrete modes of enlivening analysis. And you have the table of contents in front of you. As you can see, we were lucky to be able to convince an incredible group of people to join us in, in the adventure of this book. They make explicit the how of analysis rather than theorize it, the concept of analysis, as a generalized idea. So as a result, we have 19 answers to the question of how is analysis rather than what it is. We offer these answers as companions for ethnographers in academia and beyond, people that are starting their first projects or people that are working on one of many other projects. We hope that readers feel confident to borrow the thinking habits that they encounter in the book and to adjust them to their own works. 
when we invited this group of people to join us, we gave them a few uh, guidelines. One was that the contributions were going to be short, uh, around 4,000 words. Second, that the contributions uh, hopefully had to be ethnographically grounded, and this meant either uh, borrowing or dealing with ethnographic materials or turning an ethnographic eye to their own practices, and I should say and or here. And third, that each chapter would result in a protocol that could be offered as a token of what you could find in the chapter. So just one last word on the protocol before we move on. Our decision to use the concept of an analytic protocol in this collection is of course tied to the tumultuous history of experimentation in laboratories and other settings, a history that is also violent. In those spaces, a protocol, we are told, is the experimenter's practical guide to generate new insights while following a series of standardized steps. Will you follow those steps from one iteration to, of your experiment to the next? As we deploy the notion of a protocol here, we want to, in a way, refuse any fiction of pure replicability, rejecting any kind of connotations of a protocol as a device that closes off variation. However, we do want to embrace the sense of repetition that it invokes. The protocols and the repetitions help us suspend the rush. They increase the duration of analysis or what we might call analytic duration. And they help us enliven the ethnographic singularities of our work. And so with this, I now I'm going to pass it to my co-editor, Britt Ross Vintereich, and we will continue to the next with the next moment in this get together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea, and uh, it's a pleasure to open the next part of the program, which is the three interventions by Nikki Lanan, Don Nafis, and Marilyn Strathern. But first, allow me to welcome everybody as well. It's a huge pleasure, and I'm touched by all the greetings from around the world in the chat. Um, it's, it's really amazing. Thank you so much for joining. Um, we have now three short interventions and uh, the first person to come on stage is Nikki Lanan, who is an associate professor at University of Pennsylvania. His research focuses on cities, infrastructure, state power and climate change. He studies these complex entities through ethnographies of the political ecology of cities read through water. His forthcoming book, Urban Seas, is based on fieldwork with fish, fishers, scientists, and planners. And Nikhil, thank you so much for being here and for accepting our invitation to speak about the book. The word is yours. Good evening from here, um, and happy birthday to the book. Um, and congratulations to, to Andrea, to Britt, and to all those that composed the Ethnography Studio and the Ethos Lab that composed uh, this book. Um, Thank you so much for this invitation to celebrate the book with you all. Um, I think it's my first first book birthday <laughs> or first birthday book party. Um, and it's nice to be here. Um, I actually had the, the opportunity to teach this book in the spring um, of this past, this past spring of 2022 um, to a group of um, graduate students in anthropology that were mostly anthropology that were heading to for a year of ethnographic field work or would be in the following year. And I can only um, share and communicate uh, the, 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 the animatedness and excitement with which they both received and ran with the materials that you prepared. So thank you so much. It's never easy to teach methods, um, more so because of how little there is um, on methods um, and particularly on analysis. And this was actually a book that that um, that actually uh, I don't want to say filled a void, but more like inspired a way of, of engaging and, and being with um, the practice of ethnographic research. Um, 
Um, experimenting with ethnography begins by insisting that analysis is a concrete mode of action that creates openings. And the book suggests that fieldwork does not, um, or noticing does not precede analysis, but that analysis is actually a way, uh, uh, analysis seeks a way of noticing, right? Um, processes are noticed uh, with analysis. So if analysis is a, is a site where insights are generated with what's enlivened um, as a space of imaginative thinking, um, it's really remarkable of how little we prepare and train uh, uh, students and ourselves in, in, in the arts and, and crafts of analysis. Um, and, and, and I am so grateful for this book to, to provoke us to think about the systemicity of those practices. So this is all great, right? Um, and as you might, as, as, as Andrea pointed out in the introduction, the book is very much centered um, on the how of analysis and the contributions, um, and I think maybe 17, I'm losing the exact number, um, posit and each conclude their essays um, with protocols that are um, provocations of, of, of ways of doing um, analysis. Now, the, the, the term protocol, I think is a little bit, um, misleading in a way that it, it draws on our expectations of, of, of formulas and, and, and um, replicable methods. Um, but the protocols in this book are anything but formulaic. Um, they're not templates um, or practices that validate knowledge and their replicability. Um, but protocols in the book are very much um, forms to create the space for analysis, to create space for the unruly findings of ethnography to flourish and unsettle, to slow down and pause reasoning and to dwell in the not knowable. And to the extent that each of the protocols in the book are, are inhabiting this zone, they make new worlds perceivable and new methods thinkable, um, even if they sometimes may bring um, the researcher to an impasse to the not knowable. Um, in class, we read most all of the book. Um, we thought through the protocols of the hunch, of diagrams, of drafts, of files as organizations of data, the ways of being with and not knowing um, a situation itself that is worked through by feeling the knot of incommensurate ontologies. Um, and we also worked with the other kinds of knots in the book. Um, for example, in, in her essay on touch um, as analytic, uh, Patricia Alvarez Astacio um, learns how to sense by touching um, alpaca wool. Um, a touching, which uh, she points out, is an active process a stretching, a pulling, a learning how to feel and how to see with touch. Right? So touch is not just uh, an engagement of a single sense, but it makes perceivable senses across temporal scales and affective entanglements. The, the chapter on touch uh, concludes with the tactile protocol of ways to tell stories um, with, uh, with feeling materials and material feelings and the meanings that are oftentimes attached to textures, meanings that might include sounds and smells. Um, Patricia shows in a this really generative way emerge through uh, tactile engagement. And here I think the, the provocation of, 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 of touch actually like reveal the potential of multimodal ethnography, not as replacing one sense uh, with another or, or adding the different senses together, but ways to sense uh, different kinds of senses at the same time emerging um, through touch, which I found really, really quite generative. Um, thinking with the work of, of environmental scientists, uh, Dawn Walford builds on the work of Aaron Stathern to posit analogy as a protocol and this helps to get out of an impact, impasse in the area of where STS meets anthropology, right? So where STS scholars would often suggest and have suggested that measure is dependent on the apparatuses of measurement um, to ask what this might mean when scientists are uh, refused uh, or do not think that this is in fact the case, right? So, so how do you read these two kinds of um, meanings in the world and understandings in the world together um, amidst the restlessness with situated knowledges. Um, Tone builds build, build on the work of uh, Marin Stathern uh, to think with analogy. 
um, to bring and, and bring this approach to think analogically between myth and measurement. Um, because both myth and measurement are, as one points out, um, processes, um, processes which make the seek to make um, the which are particularly interested in the transformation of the continuous uh, into the discrete, right? And so reading myth with measurement um, allows tone, reading myth with measurement and logically allows tone to, to think and, 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 and contribute to the literature of measurement in a really generative way. Striking uh, in tone space is a way in which they use snags in field work, moments of stuckness as openings to think with and think from that moment where each talks past the other, building in the book of manners to turn, um, as a vital site of analogical practice. And this brings to mind uh, literature in political ecology and development studies, which would focus on the signpost, the moment in which a development program or plan breaks down as a generative site from which to theorize um, and to think. So I won't say too much more because um, 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 supposed to be more of a conversation and a celebration with the authors. But synthesized, um, this is actually a, a wonderful book full of wonder, uh, which allows us to feel our ways through new worlds, which we can currently inhabit um, in this moment of radical discontinuity and abrupt change. Um, I have two questions um, just for the, for the, for the participants uh, and the contributors in the book. Um, and here, I, I think I would like to hear, um, you'll see a little bit more about um, the, the, the process that brought this book to, 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 into being, right? Um, how or when did you know that this was actually a project? Um, what, how did these protocols coalesce? Um, Andrea said a little bit about this in the opening. And what was the everyday work of collaboration companionship across diverse locations and geographies like not only in the making of the book, but also in, the, in its afterlives, right? As we, um, and, and, and you continue to work together. Um, and the second question is just uh, trying to think, particularly because of the ways in which so many of you are thinking in and with the literature uh, in science and technology studies about what uh, experimenting with ethnography as a project might contribute to the literature and the ethnography of experiments. And with that, I'll, I'll conclude. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was amazing. And, uh, and thank you for posing those questions that we will think through first with, with Patricia and Tone. And then um, anybody, other authors who are there in the audience are absolutely very welcome to also join in. Um, but that uh, takes us to our next um, intervention. NIST, which will be, who will be Dawn Nafis, who holds a PhD in anthropology from University of Cambridge and is now a senior research scientist at Intel Labs, where she leads research on AI, data analytics and modeling, multimodal sense making, and many other topics. And she's a co-editor with Hannah Knox of Ethnography for a Data Saturated World, which was published at Manchester University Press in 2018. And it's really wonderful to have you here as well, uh, Dawn. I would like to give the word to you to continue the party. Fantastic. Thank you um, so much for that introduction and um, happy birthday. Uh, this is a wonderful piece of work. Uh, and I can only imagine having Hannah and I having done a edited volume ourselves, we, we know what it takes behind the scenes. So uh, that work is also appreciated. I I wanted to actually speak at, at quite a personal level, and I and I hope that's that's okay. Um, it, it, it sort of communicates a bit what it's like to actually read the thing. And I'm going to do that actually by starting out with something of a personal story involving Andrea, and I hope she's not too mortified, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll do it anyway, because I, I think it really speaks to the spirit of, of what this book is, is like and about. And so Andrea and I got together many years ago now, uh, at, just after I had written um, a, a piece on um, the use of post-it notes in design settings. Uh, so I think today this would be called design thinking 
Um, and if you want to roll your eyes at design thinking, please do, because it absolutely deserves it. Um, but, you know, so this is the practice of, you know, putting lots and lots of post-it notes up on a wall, and then you bring, you bring in your, uh, your, your colleagues, your collaborators, and their observations and ideas, and because everything's moving, everything's quite dynamic and so forth. And uh, this was a moment where Andrea was just beginning her ethnography studio, and um, she was asking all sorts of questions about it, like, okay, well, what what actually happens in those in those places? And well, you know, do you think there are these moments of critical, ref you know, reflection on it? And um, you know, I found myself in this position of of trying to dampen down her enthusiasm for it <laughs> because I said, look, you know, I. I, I wrote this paper as a kind of a protest, right? Um, because we were, you know, at the time being, you know, frog marched in a way to sort of look and feel like designers, right? This is what designers did. And we were meant to fit the model. And, um, you know, I had a lab director at the time who was preoccupied with making ethnography visible to executives as if that were remotely possible. Um, so, you know, so, yeah, Andrea was much more polite uh, about this, but she was, I think the thing she was politely trying not to say was, yes, I did in fact read that paper. Um, and that's not what I want. What I what she was interested in is, well, even though all that stuff is is going on, right? So, you know, I, part of the paper was really about, look, this is a pantomime of creativity, right? What's happening here is that, um, you know, all the same power relationships that we already have, right, just sort of flow through it, right? So you end up with the best idea, uncoincidentally being the highest paid opinion in the room. And so, she says, yes, yeah, no, that's, yeah, I know that, but um, she says, but, but, but what, what else can we do, right? What else can we do with these things, with these objects, and she had noted that, well, actually, in in among Latin American NGOs, this there's an analogous process here, an analogous practice, and so is there something we can turn it around and, and abandon all that negative stuff and find something in it for us, right? And and so we we started kicking around that idea, and it was it was hugely important to me um, because it it helped me really make peace with the difference between the world as I, I thought it really should be and, and the world I was actually inhabiting. Um, and, and that sense of there's always this opportunity, right? To, to find something meaningful, to do something a bit differently, to actually do something creative. Um, that is certainly something Andrea brought back into my life and, and I, I really very much needed it at the moment having written a protest paper. Um, so then the book arrives at my door. <laughs> this was a few months ago now. And uh, one weekend, I, I pour myself a glass of wine, crack it open, and out jumps from the introduction, you know, this, this statement that, that more or less had that same effect on me. I mean, I, so I'm just going to read a little, just one line, uh, that we're proposing a series of techniques to help craft the conditions for enlivening uh, analytic insight through experiments that create a distinct time space. And so, you know, those, there are two phrases in there that really sat with me, right? Craft the conditions and a distinct time space, right? And even just reading it had this reorienting effect in a way, right? Um, and sort of reminding me that those conditions where wonder takes place, <laughs> where, where structured play might happen aren't this magical other time, right? It, it's something that we can actually do for ourselves right now. Um, and in fact, you know, the authors had done for me in the very act of writing it, right? Those conditions came um, in the act of reading itself. And, and, and you know, in a way, my, my, my headspace <laughs> went into that, that time space, right? It, it sort of brought all of that stuff back about really what's good about anthropology, what there is to love, or one of the many things to love, I should, I should say. Um, and so suddenly all of that stuff about day-to-day -day life, right, the, the million meetings, the, you know, I'm as subject to neoliberalism as you are, and uh, that stopped having as much of a grip on me. Um, and it, it, there are others, uh, other contributors who ran an, a, a separate workshop that also had that a, a similar effect, um, I, I think not coincidentally. Um, and so, so I found myself, um, right now I'm involved in a software development project um, 
which is uh, is software I believe in, but is is as boring and ordinary as anything else. And, you know, there was something about it that just having gone through this book, suddenly it reminded me, uh, I started seeing it through the lens of, oh, this is something that also deserves ethnographic reflection, right? Not because some paper could come out of it, um, but because there's something there to be curious about. Um, and that that just fundamentally changes things regardless of, of what you're gonna end up doing it, right? Um, and so I, I think what we have is a, a real treasure here, um, something that, you know, I, I hope others also would find themselves in their own kind of enlivened time space, right? Um, finding that actual pleasure in wherever your topic is is taking you, even if you never do the things in the protocol, which I suggest you do, and, I, and I'm already sort of trying to think about how I can do that for myself. Um, so, you know, I'll flip it over in terms of a, a question, which is, you know, you know I've, I've spoken in very personal terms now, and I think part of it is because, you know, I, I felt a kind of an intimacy in reading uh, these works. This was some of the contributors I know as, as people, some I don't, but it, it felt like being alongside um, and with as a kind of a collegial thing. And so I was wondering, was writing it different for you? Did it, and how did it feel to put those kinds of things on, on the page? Because it is, um, uh, it's quite the companion. And I appreciate your companionship. I'm blown away. And thank you for highlighting the craft and also the companionship. So the crafting of the conditions uh, and, and also the craft in, in making protocols uh, that can be companions is uh, very much appreciated. Thank you. And um, I will also hope that all authors have written down Dawn's questions and will reflect on it while Marilyn is speaking. So how did it feel to write uh, in this way that has the intimacy effect? Did it, was it any different or in like any other paper? Thank you. And then uh, I would like to uh, introduce Marilyn Strathern, who became a professor of social anthropology at Manchester University in 1985. In 1993, she took the position as William Wise Professor in Cambridge, a chair she held until her retirement in 2008. And Marilyn Strathern is the author of Property, Substance and Effect, Anthropological Essays on Persons and Things from 1999, and of Commons and Borderlands, Working Papers on Interdisciplinarity, Accountability and the Flow of Knowledge. And I've selected those two books um, because they've actually both inspired experimenting with ethnography along with many deeply, along with many others, uh, other of Strathern's uh, works. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here, uh, Marilyn, and I would like to pass on the word to you. Well, I'm quite thrilled to be part of these celebrations, I have to say. So let me add a third set of congratulations to the authors and editors of what I think is a quite uh, scintillating companion. Uh, the book really does give substance to the concept of experimentation in a way very much searched for, but not so often found. And I, in particular, applaud the aim to capture devices already in use or indeed well used. Although the techniques are condensed into analytical protocols, they're being described after the event. In fact, it's, I think it's important to this project that each is lodged in the events as elicited them. For that means they become available to be analyzed themselves. That is in relation to the conundrums that led to them. In other words, there's these, these are solutions and provocations to situated problems. In my mind, the temporal dimension couldn't be more important. Following what the afterwards discuss in terms of questions and answers, I remark that as a discipline's practitioners leapfrog over themselves in surging forward, the end results of analysis turn into new questions for the next surge, but the questions that drove them fall away out of lack of interest. I mean, have you ever looked at something you've written and asked why on earth did I write that? The reasons for writing so often vanish in the course of writing. 
After all, a problem resolved no longer tugs at one's brain as a problem. That said, analysis proclaims its reasons for being there. The temporality of this practice is brilliantly caught in the forward-looking protocols that are also backward-looking reflections on the resolution of specific questions dealing with certain kinds of materials. Tying the protocols into the antecedent materials also allows something else. The drive of the book is away from the kinds of abstractions that are so easily replaceable by new abstractions. Rather, the editors say, the protocols help suspend the rush. They slow the urge of swift elucidation by increasing the duration of the, of the analytic process. Just as continuing attention to the original ethnographic questions will illuminate the answers to which they gave rise, so these protocols will go on being illuminated by the materials that are tethered to them. Now, I have a real life problem that I'd like to bring to our two authors. I think I misread your rubrics uh, 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 in asking for questions for everybody. I have questions for these two authors. Um, my problem is probably closer to a pre-field than a post-field one. Both authors seem adept at what Tone calls apprehending one thing through another. Patricia's engagement with what Andy and wool weavers seemed to be doing through their hands was guided for her by what she calls a haptic visuality with her camera. Images helped to explore the material qualities of the alpaca wool. Tone found thinking through Amerindian origin myths gave them a purchase on scientific measuring in the way each interrupts a continuous world with the dialectic of nature and culture. My question is, what to do when one is invited to apprehend one thing through another by other scholars who bring an already invented world with them? It seems to me it can have an unnervingly untethering effect. At an interdisciplinary workshop in June, I spoke on some old issues in Melanesian cosmology I've been writing about for years, contesting the botanical notion of asexual reproduction with respect to tropical cultivars propagated not by seed, but by cuttings. I was working through analogies as Tone and also Graham Jones in the book will recognize, extending indigenous equations between plants and people as to how people regenerate themselves by cutting the generations from one another. They have a clear perception of procreation as simultaneously the death of the old and the life of the new, implying an intimate connection between sex and death. I wondered if we might wish to rewrite what is sexual in the replacement of the generations so as to include the plants that Melanesians refer to as persons like themselves. Now, a natural scientist responded with enthusiasm, saying that the connection between sex and death has engaged biologists for 140 years and continues to do so. Now, she and I have been in, in post-workshop correspondence, and she sent me several readings. Apart from noting that the biologist's idea of sexual reproduction seems bound up with the regeneration of individuality and hence the individuality of death on which the Melanesian material would have much to say to the contrary, I don't know what to do. I'm not yet there at Marisol de la Cadena's wonderful not knowing, nor capable of drawing, of drawing what a response might look like as Rachel Douglas Jones intimates. I quail before this friendly invitation. I don't know how to begin. Perhaps I could take to heart this volume's message to pause before thinking. Only at the moment, the pause feels like paralysis. Patricia, you talk of the illiteracy that preceded your undoing of what you had thought touch was. Tone. You talk of snags in grasping patterns that eventually became openings. Do you have any tips for me? 
Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn, um, for taking us somewhere completely other and also again to a very familiar place, which is that of paralysis before analysis. And uh, you put some very um, elaborate and also specific questions to both Tone and Patricia. And I think it's time now to pass back the word to Andrea or the walking imaginary walking stick, uh, talking stick, sorry, not the walking stick to Andrea and, uh, and you'll introduce um, our authors on stage here. And uh, thank you, Marilyn, so much for this intervention. Thank you very much, Britt, and to our, our three uh, commentators. This has been a, a real um, luxurious way to get our thoughts going. So uh, let's use this pause for me to introduce uh, Patricia and Tone and to also maybe gather some thoughts in relation to the, the topics that have been raised. So two of our incredible authors in the book are uh, going to join us in this very first part of the conversation. Dr. Patricia Alvarez Astacio, who is an assistant professor of anthropology at Brandeis University. She's an anthropologist and filmmaker who is currently working on a book entitled Moral Fibers, making fashion ethical. Uh, Patricia's chapter um, in the book, it's titled Tactile Analytics, Touching as Collective Act. Our second author is Dr. Tone Walford, who is a lecturer in digital anthropology at University College London. Their research explores the growth of digital data and, social and, and the social and cultural imaginaries that ensue from those among climate scientists and technicians in the Brazilian Amazon. And they're also working on a book uh, that is titled The Nature of Data, The Culture of Data, The Digital Worlds of Climate Change Science. Tone's chapter in the book is titled Analogy. And with that, uh, maybe I will give it to Patricia first and we can then directly move to Tone and uh, we'll take it from there. Hi, everyone. Um, happy birthday to the book as well. And thank you, Andrea and Britt, so much for um, inviting me to participate <laughs> um, from the experiment that was um, having to sit back and not just reflect, but kind of unpack and in a way systematize a process that in the moment felt like paralysis, like Marilyn just mentioned, and that kind of emerged out of what felt more like desperation, um, I feel like, as a graduate student. Um, and it was definitely a, a wonderful um, luxury to be able to recreate and reopen um, a different kind of time space, like Professor Marlene Strathern mentioned to kind of look back and reflect on the kind of situated object and kind of analysis. Um, thanks to all three commentators for their very thought provoking um, comments and questions. Um, where to start? So I'll start with um, Don's question about writing the the essay and working on the protocol. Um, I feel like it, it wasn't that it was difficult, but it felt a little bit like I was burying my soul, right? Like uh, in anthropology, we're taught that our field notes are this kind of private kind of thing that you kind of never show to anyone, right? It's this kind of black box in a way of, of our discipline. Um, and the analysis, like, you know, the introduction to the book particularly explains is also this kind of mystic process that in a way reproduces this idea of like this kind of creative genius. Um, um, and so the process of writing it in a way felt like getting naked in public or something similar to that. It was not just about like step 
stepping back and really thinking about, wait, how does this happen? What, what did doing and redoing, right? What did looking and working through footage actually did, right? Let me pause and rewind and unpack that. But it was also kind of getting very exposed. And in that sense, um, I couldn't find any other way of writing that it wasn't kind of intimate because it felt like that. But it was also completely terrifying, <laughs> if I if I will admit. Um, and but that being said, I think there was also alongside with the fear this kind of I, I don't know if pleasure is the word, but this kind of um, enjoyment of in a way forming a kind of bond that you will form with someone only by sharing, right? The kind of special texture that emerges from this kind of intimate contact and trust, right? In a way there was something, it felt like I was opening up myself at the same time to a friend, <laughs> right? Or someone, right? And there was a lot of kind of beauty and poetics in that process as well. Um, but again, that is something that we don't tend to necessarily do with academic writing and that I do in film and with other kind of multimodal projects. Um, so writing itself in a way was an experimental process. Um, yes. <laughs> um, and, and in thinking about Mikila Nant's provocation, um, You know, a lot of the literature in, in STS and in anthropology, right, we're thinking, right, and reflecting and analyzing the idea of the experiment itself. And usually that seems to me, in my experience, that has been divorced from the process of experimenting and putting oneself through that. And so I think that the different essays and the book out of itself kind of contributes or, or, or opens the possibility, right, of not reproducing this kind of binary of like kind of let's think and unpack and analyze and get back to the roots and let's decolonize the experiment or, you know, so on and so forth, but to kind of potentially get through um, to kind of thinking about the notion of the experiment and the critiques or maybe opening up the experimental as an otherwise um, by experimenting, right? And kind of working through kind of both together and rather than one and the other. Um, and I think that's like very exciting and, I, and, and it's something, you know, I have an arts background. So I think that's something that in the arts maybe we kind of experiment, but not necessarily kind of necessarily has to retrofit or kind of engage in this dialectical process, right? And I think that the book, encur book encourages us to kind of approach those conversations in this kind of dialectic theory kind of practice um, way um, that sees creativity and imagination as also producing serious knowledge. Um, and <laughs> I don't want to take up too much time, but um, I to the real life problem <laughs> that Marlene Strathern proposed um, here. I've been thinking about it all morning, actually, because she was so generous to share the essay a little bit in advance um, with with us. Um, and the more I kept thinking about it, the more my mind goes to right how I work which is what can I do to think through the process? I think a lot through making. Making is kind of key to my own process. So I was thinking about, well, how can I grab some of those plants or look at those illustrations, right? And maybe kind of put to the side for a moment this kind of conundrum of the... The, the two kind of analogical systems and maybe 
kind of explore the different objects and think about the plants and their biology and their physicality and kind of play with that and make a note with that and then potentially return to those worlds right and I think that was kind of key to how I ended up working through touch and tactility um, and this kind of excess right um, of a feeling um, and potentially see where that might one take and it doesn't you know I don't know if plants are accessible but thinking through the illustrations the videos right the kind of images and and kind of maybe find a way out of right the kind of world that you're being pulled in but also right the 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 kind of two kind of analogic system um and and then I yeah, and then I don't know much where to go from there, but we hopefully we can keep talking and brainstorming because it was like a really fascinating provocation. So, um, Tone? Well, I, I get to go at the end. So I've <clears throat> had the benefit of listening to everyone else's amazing um, comments and provocations. I'd like to add my thanks to the, um, you know, plethora of thanks that has rained down upon Andrea and Britt for organizing this um, and also all the other authors. Um, it was I mean, so it was, it, I guess it was a year, but time's gone funny, hasn't it? So, I mean, we know it's a year because it's a birthday. So that's how we know. But I, I feel like um, the whole process itself was one of the most enjoyable publication processes that I've ever been involved in, in terms of the way in which Britt and Andrea took care of us through that process. Um, and that's, I think, not just because I sort of personally know Britt, um, so she got obliged. I think actually it was a, a deliberate ethos of care that they um, developed around the book. So I'd like to thank them for that. Um, so I'm also obviously don't want to take up too much time because I also being at the end, I can I can say that. Um, so that people don't get too bored before you get to contribute yourselves. But I, um, I'm going to try and pick up on. I'm going to pick up on Dawn's uh, question, I suppose, around what it was like to write. Uh, the book in order to answer Anand's question um, about, uh, Nicole's question, sorry, about um, about the that play on words between experimenting with, their, uh, with their ethnography and ethnographies of experimentation. Because what I felt writing the book was a sense of emergence. So, um, so I became someone who had a protocol. I was like, wow, I'm a person who has a protocol. But, so they asked me like, will you do this thing? And I was like, well, I, I guess so, I guess I'll do this. And then through that process, I became the kind of person who had a bit of knowledge they could pass on in this way, which is not something I was used to doing. It's not the way in which I research would write and it should be the way that I teach, but it's not really the way that I teach. And so um, even though I suppose there was a sense in which, and I don't know how many of the other authors had this sensation as well, there was a sense in which it was something I was already doing. There was also something very creative and um, generative, I suppose, reproductive in a sense about what I became through the act of, of doing it. And I guess this, in a sense, is what experiments are all about, right? So if you take any kind of uh, ethnography of experimentation, I was just sort of running through them in my head when you were talking, Nico, about what, you know, because they, they've actually come a long way from the tour and Woolga, right? So if you think about what ethnographies of experimentation are now, We've got on the one hand that kind of classic, you know, maybe Latorian and Isabel Stenger idea of a thing being brought into existence at the same time as, um, you know, the, the reality of the neutrino or whatever it is being brought into existence at the same time as the kind of knowledge and social infrastructures that allow it to exist are being brought into existence as kind of co-creation. But you've also got people like Joe Dumas and Natasha Myers who have talked much, who are also really interested in the kind of, the kind of ways in which scientists themselves have to bring themselves and their bodies into the presence of the thing in order to elicit its existence. And so I think that that tension between bringing something to exist, which is already there, is actually very much in the spirit of the kind of experiment this book, for me anyway, was, is that I suddenly, I, you know, I became someone who'd always already had a protocol. And I really appreciated that transformation uh, in terms of my sense of um, kind of professional pride, I suppose. Um, so the other, and then the other kind of aspect, I suppose, which I really, um, it struck me about, which I've already mentioned about kind of being a part of this project was the care and, and intimacy that I didn't know. I mean, I was trying to think back. I didn't exactly know how, so it'd be interesting if Britt and Andrea could write a protocol for how they did the editorial work of this book. 
So because like I can't I did I can't put my finger on like how exactly you did it, but there was a sense in which we were all involved and there was a lot of efforts and I guess a lot of the labor that was very explicit because there were time zones to manage and all kinds of different people doing all kinds of different things. And then there was also a very kind of careful um, and precise way in which we were led through what we were meant to be doing and who the audience was going to be and what we, you know, what they kind of wanted from us, which is a, also a kind of um, a kind of care it is not to be kind of slapdash in the way in which you treat the people who are in who are in your in your book. Right. Um, and I suppose that for me, that kind of care and intimacy for me speaks quite a lot to um, one of the things that came up in Marilyn's comment, which was about the temporal dimensions of the book. And particularly how I read anyway, Marilyn, your comment was, was this kind of frenetic need to pose novelty the whole time, to constantly pose something as against or you know a new version of something that has been before and I'm I've um, been reading um, I kind of the thing that's in my head around this is um, Tiffany Lefabio King's work around intersectionality within the neoliberal university and the necessity of actually not allowing that to happen and I feel like these tools or you know maybe the protocol that might emerge from the editorial work of the book about taking the time to be careful and taking the time to nurture a kind of intimacy to slow down the long the long quite long process which we went through the kind of all of that served I think as a, for me anyway as a really um, important reminder of maybe something that you were talking about Dawn as well which is like why we're doing what we're doing like what are we actually doing and that also speaks to another question that you raised Marilyn which is like why did I write this like what am I actually you know I have these moments where I'm like what am I even doing being an academic ah you know and I think that there and I think that the process of being in this book did help me remember that I mean I'm, I'm, in, I'm personally in a moment of forgetting again but but it did at the time help me remember that so um so yes, yeah, so I so I guess just to finish on your your uh, your kind of um, provocation, Marilyn, at the end, which was, which is what should you do about? It was like an you, it was like an agony aunt letter that you wrote to us, like what, please, dear Tone and dear Tone and Patricia, help have been approached by scientists. Um, um, so um, <laughs> one of the things that emerged for me out of writing and becoming someone who has a protocol um, was that was how important it was to be deliberate in what we in what we and how we do our analysis particularly with something like analogy which has a kind of history i suppose of um i don't know how you would say it. it has a kind of history of as if there are a priori reasons that one thing might be comparable to another which is something obviously that marina has unpacked a lot in her work and which i've used shamelessly in my chapter to now be here talking to you about it um so this so one of the things that really I think that I'm, I find useful about thinking through this kind of analogical practice that I do was just, and more generally was thinking about kind of deliberate forms of relating. And um, so I, you know, I would, and this is something which has come out of other people's work, I think, who have also been put into a position of having to or wanting to collaborate with natural scientists as anthropologists. I'm thinking of Anna Singh and her group around the Anthropocene. But I think the question that I would ask you, so you know, agony aunts always pose another question at the end when they reply to the, the person, so they're never going to be caught out. Is is you know, do you want to collaborate with this person? Can is this can, is this a deliberate relationship which you'd like to cultivate, or is this something where you could actually politely politely decline? Because you don't have to analogize everything. You don't have to relate to everything. You don't have to make this more than just a nice cup of tea. But that might require some, you know, you might have to go into hiding for a while if there's some who you see day to day. So I'll start there. Thank you so much, uh, Tone. I just have to say that if I had uh, received a letter from Marilyn Strathairn asking for a tip, I sort of would have frozen myself. So uh, it's it's really wonderful to, to see these conversations uh, unfolding and uh, this uh, co-thinking happen uh, in real time. Um, I'll just say maybe one thing about the editorial process and then maybe we'll, we'll open it up. Um, I think one of the keys for this project was the fact that we decided that we were going to take the time that it needed. Now, this is a luxury, but it's also a luxury uh, uh, 
with the awareness that it has consequences in the worlds where people count publications and uh, you know how quickly they come. So it's a luxury, not without risks, but it's a, a, a decision that we we made early on that the book needed its own duration uh, to happen. And this is not only a matter of if you want principle or a, a, you know an orientation towards temporality, just very pragmatically in terms of the obligations and the time that people had to devote to this. We want we didn't want the protocols or the chapters to be uh, those promises that you make and then you're pulling your hair because you know, I just can't find the time to you know fulfill my obligation to this person. The other thing uh, that I'll say, and I'm really happy to see that uh, our uh, grad student uh, uh, collaborators are in the room, the four people that wrote the, the afterwards, we organized an internal peer review process where two graduate students uh, peer reviewed all of the contributions. So we had this moment of, of co collaborative thinking happen as an internal uh, step in the process. Um, and then we moved on to you know, the process that happens in through the press. Mm -hmm. I think that was a really important uh, moment uh, for all of those involved that really helped in, the, in this collective conversation that we were having. Um, and uh, the last thing I'm just, I lost it. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say, um, it, it just escaped my mind in terms of the- uh, of Andrea, the can I add one thing? Yes. That maybe as your third, which would be uh, that we both felt uh, an extreme need for this book and therefore we needed uh, everyone's help to bring it uh, into the world. And so I think the care was also, uh, you know, came out of the respect and admiration for everybody who had actually was uh, joined us on this, um, well, very long, but also uh, very necessary journey. Mm -hmm. So uh, at least for me, if that was uh, also possible to protocolize that I think it would have to be um, about this uh, respect that we had for everyone's work and also our um, very amazing conversation with Marilyn at the very beginning in Cambridge uh, over tea and biscuits that also really put a lot of spirit into the, the whole project that we felt uh, that that Marilyn somehow also was part of it uh, from there. Great, and the last thing I'll say, I remembered where it was, um, it is, it might seem surprising, but we didn't have a lot of moments when we were all together. Uh, we had a Zoom meeting early on, um, and then I think we had one other meeting, but everything else happened uh, not, in this format that we're in now. Uh, we started this project well before the pandemic and you know it was another uh, set of circumstances. But now that I think back about it and I hear about this sense of intimacy and care and, and closeness, it just, first of all, makes me very, very happy. And second, I was thinking back about the practical things that we did and they didn't require this trying to bring everybody together, which is a really interesting uh, thing to think about in terms of how you can build intimacy without the, the, you know, the thing that you would go initially to, which is having everybody in a same location. Um, so with that, I think maybe it's time to open it up uh, for maybe other authors uh, in, the, in the meeting or um, uh, questions. If you uh, you could raise your hand uh, if you if you have, and I see uh, uh, Lassie Suchman's hand. Uh, so let's start with the 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 real hand that I see on the screen. Yeah, thank you so much um, to everyone for for well, thank you for for organizing us um, both in the book and in this event, and um, just a, a few thoughts. Um, and maybe, uh, you know, I'm hesitant, but maybe the, 
the, the fragment of a response to Marilyn's question. <laughs> um, I do think the, the protocol, uh, the protocol that you set for the book that required us all to develop a protocol was brilliant. Um, and, and I, and I very much uh, appreciate what Marilyn said about the temporality of that and the kind of the protocol that comes after the event, um, which is the kind of reflection back on the event. And, and for us and for me, this was a, a part of a collaboration. And it's interesting to kind of think about the difference between doing this a, a protocol for your own relations to your materials and a protocol for collaboration as, as in the case of the chapter that I did with Andre Dani and, and Laura Watts. Um, but this playful, um, playful treatment of the protocol, I think was very um, generative and, uh, and invited us to both um, articulate, uh, you know, a, a set of instructions and then also to think about how to enact them in the chapter itself, which was which was really lovely and and you know challenging but fun. Um, and then I was just thinking about um, Marilyn's question um, because I guess I recognize this uh, where where to begin. You know, wh where do I begin? <laughs> and the only the only thought I have on that is. Um, and, it, and this kind of is, is also provoked by the idea of the snag um, that Tun introduces um, in, in their protocol, um, is, is to actually begin with something that your interlocutor presents you with, um, whether it's, you know, and, and something small, perhaps, you know, a small, uh, a phrase, a, 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 you know, a proposition, um, so that, that, that offers a kind of way in, at, at least for me, when I've been faced with that kind of chasm, <laughs> um, you know, it, a chasm between myself and someone who is, you know, coming forward with an invitation, uh, who, who thinks that we have some incredibly strong thread that joins us, <laughs> but we're, we're actually articulating the difference the differences um, that matter is such an enormous, feels like such an enormous task. So that's sort of finding, finding something in there, what they have presented to you, I've found can be very helpful. So, so that's it. And just again, um, thanks so much for this event. It's lovely. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, Thank you so much. Um, and thank you again, uh, Andrea and Bridge, for including uh, me in this amazing book. And I've really enjoyed the process so much. So I can just, you know, reiterate what has been said about that. Um, I just wanted to add to this uh, discussion that uh, now Lucy also um, talked more about uh, with some of the questions that were uh, raised by Marilyn Strathern. Uh, and I think it's really interesting, this whole thing about thinking, you know, what what uh, was mentioned as paralysis uh, before analysis, where what is it that happens in those uncomfortable moments? And I think that the chapter that I was part of writing together with a colleague was the one about uh, object exchange. And to, what I wanted to share is that um, for us, uh, one uh, path has been um, that when you encounter something in your field notes, in your field, um, you encounter something, it can be uh, an, a picture that you took during field work, it can be a little excerpt from an interview. But it's something that stays with you and it's something that kind of maybe even bothers you and haunts you. It's something that you know is really important, um, but you just don't know what to do about it. You know that you have to do something because it's, it calls for you, but you just don't know what. And, and there, uh, our kind of approach to it has been to then exchange that a particular object with a, a, a trusted colleague. And um, it was just a very interesting uh, journey to experiment with that. Um, 
and try and see what actually happens also in what I could call a more like personal emotional level when you actually hand over something that is so potent and potentially problematic and difficult to wrap your head around and uh, and then hand it over to someone else and then completely let go of it and really let go of it for a, a set period of time. And I just wanted to share that um, that that has a lot of um, yeah personal emotional um, um, aspects as well um, and and then re and then what happens when you then receive your object back in re in return afterwards has the object changed as a condensation of what you are you saw as important uh, elements in your field has it changed and what has it done for you so um i at least want to share that i have i noticed a lot of of those things uh, going on for me personally and also for you know the the fear of being you know i have given over my object to someone else what are they going to do with it <laughs> and uh, and what will happen now i have lost complete control and i just think that's an interesting thing for us to think through in the academic world where we so often sit alone with those fears so um yeah just a comment thank you so much Thank you so much, uh, Trine. Do we have any other, uh, Tim, the floor is yours. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I too, though I'm not a working anthropologist, really enjoyed the book um, uh, from a number of perspectives. And what I guess I have here is, is it's not exactly a question, it's a push um, in that I'm really interested in the form uh, that the book takes and, and whether we can get it into a form that's not just a book. Uh, because I actually think that the um, the use of the, the, the of protocols as a way of, of thinking about this opens up some really interesting other models uh, of what other some of the other sciences are doing uh, and how they're pushing, uh, how they publish and how they do research and how they iterate on each other's efforts. Um, so I'm I, I I keep thinking that um, so part of uh, why I think this was such a a, a needed book is because that that we we were struggling I I've struggled into trying to figure out what it is that anthropology uh, does for me I studied anthropology I don't practice it but it influences what I do every day as a as a as a, a you know a, a form of opening up thought. Um, and we're capturing a lot of these sort of ways. How do we get get to that? Um, and I want to see a space where more people can create these, uh, can share, can iterate on others. Um, and to me, the book form uh, is great for sharing what you guys produced. Um, and then we can talk about it, but we can't, it's much harder to, to iterate. And it's much harder to make it small enough so that we can all um, share what we're doing. Um, so I, uh, I'll just drop in the, um, uh, in, in, uh, sorry, here we go. Um, another project that's really similar, uh, which I discovered, which is called the, uh, an ethnogra excuse me, an ethnographic inventory, um, which is a, a, a similar, really interesting project, um, that launched, I think two, one or two years ago, uh, um, that's online, but in a sense, they're trying to figure out how people can start sharing um, what it means for them to do ethnography um, in these approachable little segments. Um, and I could certainly see, uh, you know, an instance of the, you know, of piece of the platform for experimental collaborative ethnography, um, which would be a great digital forum because it en enables people to publish documents and then other people to comment on them and other people to link them in all sorts of different ways. There's so many ways that we could sort of extract this, um, uh, this back end of anthropology and make it more approachable and workable. Um, so I'm just interested to figure out whether there's a way of, of doing more of this. Thank you, Tim. I'll, I'll get started and uh, others can, can jump in. There's always a way, in a way, right? <laughs> um, so a little bit of, of backstory. We had all of these plans of creating a website and having the protocols be changing in time. 
uh, started instead of being one thing, uh, the authors and others being able to comment on how they've used them and so on and so forth. Uh, so there's, you know, there's the, the, the imagination of what's possible, it's always expansive, and you might imagine what's coming, right, what I'm going to say next. It's the question of the labor, um, and it's a question of the social conditions of, of making this happen that tend to go against uh, the, that possibility. But putting that aside, you know, that's my, uh, Don, that's my complaint paper, uh, uh, you know, uh, accepting that is the case, I think we are in a, at a very interesting moment in which many people uh, are interested in sort of opening the, the curtains and showing what's happening behind. And uh, it's, it's just a question of the labor, just the question of the labor and how we organize things. Um, so I'll, I don't know if Britt, you want to add something or others want to add. Uh, just I don't have a lot more to say than yes, right? The other thing that I would add now, um, not as, uh, you know, as a point of reflection, is the question of uh, how the presumption that things can travel and be shared uh, endlessly uh, operates, where is that coming from? Uh, you know, as anthropologists, we can't, we couldn't do it without asking that question. Uh, the infinite extent, extensibility or extension uh, to borrow tomes of uh, wording in, in their chapter. Um, and then the other thing, the inherent moral value in it. It's something that I would also think carefully about. Not to not do it, but to say if we are, find ourselves in a context in which the, the political and economic push is towards let's share more, let's make everything movable, how do we position ourselves in that political and economic context? Um, but I'll stop there. I think it's a, a, a brilliant conversation to be had and to borrow Patricia's wording, uh, not only to speak about it, but to do with the provocation. Um, uh, Rachel. Hi, everyone. Um, so uh, I contributed a chapter to this this collection as well. And I want to start again with thanks to everybody who was involved, because uh, as you'll have come to understand, it was really uh, a very careful and thoughtful process. Um, and I had some reflections on the questions that were posed. Um, just picking up on this question of how things are shared and the experiment with extension, because the creation of these protocols, we were all writing chapters that did envisage someone reading them eventually at some point. Um, and in my case, it was strangely one of the most straightforward pieces of writing I've done. I sat down over Christmas um, and I just explained to a unknown but unknown friend essentially what it was that I had tried to do when I was learning how to draw as a form of analysis uh, and I think there was a an imagined intimacy there between me and that future reader the, the readers that Nikhil has had in, in his class and who've read that piece um, and hopefully uh, got to play with the ideas in it um, because we didn't yet know what it would become uh, I was starting to supervise my first PhD students. And I thought, well, maybe this could be something um, that could be useful to them. So in a way that responds both to Nikhil's question and, and Dawn's about the experience of, of trying to send these ways of thinking into the world. Um, and I also wanted to, to come in on, on Marilyn's question about uh, analysis and where she is at right now, um, because we've talked a lot about the how of analysis, and that's what this book is really offering its readers. But there's also a question about the site of analysis, and there's an assumption that the site belongs to us as ethnographers. And I know that that's the intended audience, but as ethnographers, we're always encountering the analyses of others all the time. And when someone approaches you and they see you as a potential collaborator or someone that understands them or you could understand, sometimes we feel misunderstood, that they haven't quite got us. And I think there's a huge generativity in those moments of misunderstanding or our sense of misunderstanding, because it means we're encountering someone else's analysis that we have not yet understood. 
Um, so the question then becomes, what can that do? What can that moment and that sight of seeming misunderstanding do? And to whom can it do that work? So those were my thoughts on these really wonderful commentaries on the on the book, and I thank you all for them. Thank you so much, Rachel. Do we have any other questions or reactions from the speakers? Uh... Well, I just wanted to <laughs> say, to say, I mean, th this, this is all for real, you realize? I mean, I am actually looking for help. And I think I've, I've derived actually a tremendous amount of help. And I'm delighted. Um, and I just hope that the, 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 the exhibition, this ex exhibition will be of help to others as well. Um, um, right at the beginning, Andre. I mean, you said that you know that the issue of, uh, that you were cult you were cultivating this disposition to note what seems to be there, and the biologist th saw something in what I had said, and that, that and that I think is my quandary. I'm recognizing a, a, a co-spirit. Who, who is prepared to find something in an unanticipated, I and mean, she had no idea she'd be have any interest at all in New Guinea, that, that she finds an unanticipated sight, as Rachel has just said, um, of, 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 of reflection uh, uh, in, in, in a sense. Um, but I think what some of the comments have helped me, particularly this issue of, well, why not bundle up your precious thoughts and hand them to somebody else because then actually that moment of dispossession um, already starts to transform the whole problem. Um, I, I think, I think the, the orientation of the comments in, 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 in those terms, um, uh, which is reinforced by what um, Lucy was um, saying about, um, about attending also to the objects that are contained within what one's interlocutor is, is presenting to you, um, is all very helpful. I mean, yes, one has to d disengage, um, I think, from, from, from uh, relating in a sense. And, 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 and that, is, that is where, um, where, where, where Tone, of course, uh, challenged me, uh, saying that, of course, one doesn't have to relate. But actually, I don't know. I mean, uh, when somebody is already, you're already in a, in a relationship. So that there's, there's no one, one cannot not relate, and even even sort of ignoring it and so forth then becomes a form of uh, you know a form a form of a form of uh, counter relating. Anyway, I, I I I'm in a rather different position now, and I'm very grateful. <laughs> well, that that's great to hear, and uh, I don't know, Britt, do you do you have any closing thoughts before we let people go? Only a very sincere thank you all. It has been lovely to be with you here and, and thank you for all uh, the contributions, um, both the planned and the unplanned ones. Uh, it's, a, it's a gift. Thank you. Thank you so much. It, it has really been uh, a wonderful uh, time uh, to have spent with all of you. There's so many uh, little pieces that I would love to pick up. I would love to think more about how these can be transformed in some way so that it can reach other people. Uh, I would like to think more about how we can turn the own editing process into a protocol itself. The question of how might we think about uh, ethnographies of experimentation differently through uh, the, the kind of experimentation that we have done. And really, really importantly for me, you know having experienced what we have been experiencing in the world for the past two or three years, to think, uh, to hear that people uh, have really valued this effort that we put into creating very close and, and into carefully creating relations uh, so that we can end up with a book, which is great, uh, but I think even greater are all of the other things that happened around, around the book. Uh, so thank you all very much. Thank you for making time to join us. You will be hearing uh, from the Ethnography Studio about our next events if you signed up for your list, uh, for the list, uh, email list. And I hope you all have a, a great rest of the week. And again, thank you very much.